In a fairy tale, the hero always has to go through all these obstacles before they get to the real highlight of fighting the dragon and winning the kingdom, or at least half the kingdom. And now we're at the similar stage. Part one of lecture two was to go through all the obstacles so we could get to the cave where the dragon lives. And now we can engage in part two of lecture two in the fight with the dragon and get our reward at the end. So hold on tight. Here comes part two of lecture two, the applications of the 4D spinahelicity formalism for massless particles. Let's start with three particle amplitudes. Now in lecture one, we saw that the Mandelstam variables always vanish at three point due to three particle kinematics. For example, S12 was P1 plus P2 squared, but by momentum conservation, this is P3 squared, which on shell is zero for a massless particle. But now we learned that S12 is also angle bracket 1, 2 times square bracket 1, 2. And if this has to vanish, that must mean that either angle 1, 2 is zero or square spinner 1, 2 is zero. That leaves the opportunity for one of them to be non-zero. And that's how we can build three particle amplitudes with spin. Now, let's suppose we're in the situation where angle spinner one, two is non-vanishing. Let's then combine angle one, two with square two, three. Note here that we have an angle two and a square two together. So we can rewrite this using our angle square spinner as one P two squares contracted with square spinner three. And just to get the indices completely clear, we have an A dot, A dot, B, B, all contracted. Now I use momentum conservation, again at three point, that means that P2 is minus P1 minus P3. Everybody is outgoing, as you recall. And now we arrive at another important point, which was that we had the massless while equation. Which says that in particular, P1 dotted into angle bracket P1 angle bracket for P1 is zero. And likewise, that square spinner, th square spinner three is a null vector of the two by two matrix P3. So that is also zero. Now, when you use this up here, you'll conclude that this must vanish. But this is a product of one thing that we assumed was non-vanishing. And another thing, if that is to be zero, then we conclude that square spinner 2, 3 must be zero. You can do the same calculation and then use that to show that in fact 1, 3 has to be zero just as 2, 3 was zero just as um, Oh, sorry. So that, that all, all these square brackets have to be zero, just as also um, one, two has to be zero square bracket. Excuse me for that. Another way of thinking about this is that this must mean, because all these dot products or contractions of the square spinners are zero, this is the same as saying that all the square brackets, all this, sorry, all, all the square spinners must be parallel to each other. So we are in a situation where three particle kinematics for massless particles. In three particle kinematics, we must have either that all the square brackets are parallel to each other or all the angle so either all the square spinners are parallel to each other or all the angle spinners are parallel to each other. But whichever option it is, that leaves the opportunity for the other set 
of either angles or square brackets to be non-vanishing. So let's now suppose that it's the square brackets that are non-vanishing. And in turn, that turns out uh, that that's the correct option for the situation where the sum of the helicities of the free particles is positive, or at least non-negative. So that's the correct option for that case. Now, what does this then imply? It means that any three particle amplitude with particles one with helicity one, H1, particle two with helicity H2, and particle three with helicity H3 must be some combination of the three types of square brackets that we have available times some coupling that for now I'll just call G. So it must be that this is square bracket 1, 2 to some power that I'll call x3, square bracket 2, 3 to some power that I'll call x1, times square bracket 1, 3 to some power that I'll call x2. Now, we can't have any dependence on the angle spinners because in our free particle kinematics, all the angle brackets vanish, and so this is uh, the general answer for what this is. Now enters an important piece of information that we learned about in the first part of lecture two, namely little group scaling. In the idea is, again, here written out a little bit more explicitly than I did in the previous part, namely that I take, I leave all my, uh, my I, I write out explicitly the dependence on the amplitudes on angle and square spinners, as well as the helicity, and for the ith particle, I include a little group scaling, and then I relate the result of the amplitude to the one where they haven't scaled. And the answer is, as we saw, based on the external line wave functions and polarizations, that the amplitude scale homogeneously with a factor t to the minus 2 times the helicity of particle i. And this is true for each one of the external particles. So let's try to do this with particle one. So we'll do a little group scaling of particle one in our amplitude up here. So what do I get? I get that A3, and I'll leave the argument implicit, must scale by the little group scaling as t to the minus two h1 times A3 under the little group. But on the other hand, I can also look explicitly at this expression here and use that the square spinners all for, for line one all scale with t to the minus one. And so I have one here and I have one there. And so I can immediately see that it must also be true that A3 scales as t to the minus x3 minus x2. And for both these statements to be true, it then must be that 2 times h1 is equal to x2 plus x3. If I likewise do little group scaling for p2, 1 at a time, I'll end up with two similar equations, namely that 2, and let me write them maybe separately down here, Namely, I'll see that 2h2 is equal to x1 plus x3, and 2h3 is equal to x1 plus x2. And if I combine these three equations for three unknowns, x1, x2, and x3, in terms of the helicities, I can easily solve these linear equations, and that will imply that x1 is equal to h2 plus h3 minus h1, x2 is x1 plus x3 minus x2, sorry, h2, x3 is h1 plus h2 minus h3.
And now this gives a very important result, namely that for massless particles, the free particle amplitudes are uniquely fixed in terms of their kinematics by their helicities up to an overall scaling, which is just the coupling. So let's write this down. The free particle on shell amplitudes of massless particles are uniquely fixed by the helicities up to an overall constant. So very good. So this is the answer for what the amplitude is. It is given completely in terms of the square brackets when the sum of helicities is positive. You would do the similar equivalent thing in terms of angle brackets if the sum of helicities were to be negative. All right. Now let's also comment a little bit on the coupling about its mass dimension. So what is the mass dimension of the coupling? Well, let's take a look. We know for a, a three particle amplitude. In fact, if I if I if, uh, let me just recall from last time, an n particle amplitude has mass dimension, which is um, four minus n. So, in particular, for a three particle amplitude, the mass dimension is one. So looking at mass dimension up here and recalling that Sij, for example, is angle Ij, square Ij, or equivalent that Pi can be written in terms of angles and squares, it is evident that each of the brackets has mass dimension 1. So in particular, this implies that the mass dimension of an angle bracket is equal to the mass dimension of a square bracket. And it is one. They're basically momentum variables. And so it must be that the mass dimension of this amplitude is also whatever is the mass dimension of the coupling G plus x1 plus x2 plus x3. And if I sum up the x1, x2, and x3 in terms of the helicities, I'll find that this is the same as the mass dimension of G plus h1 plus h2 plus h3. In other words, the mass dimension of the coupling is 1 minus the sum of the helicities. And this is in fact why there is a relation between the sum of the helicities and whether I should use angle or square brackets. Uh, and that is basically determined that you don't get any weird poles from amplitudes of three point in a local theory that simply should be impossible. And that's why you, you're forced into a certain choice of whether to use angles or square brackets. You could convince yourself by doing some examples of this. By the way, this, by the way, the, there's a certain sense here that if the sum of the helicities gets very high, then you end up with a G with negative mass dimension. And that makes sense because if the G's take higher, the, the helicities take higher values, you can end up with X's with higher values. That means there's a higher momentum dependence in your couplings, which tends to be something with greater mass dimension. All right, now let us remind ourselves about one other thing that has a similar feature. Namely, if you have studied conformal field theories, then you'll know that three-point correlators are also fixed by conformal symmetry. And they're fixed up to an overall constant. And if I were to write down uh, in particular, a scalar operator, a scalar correlator, 
meaning that I have three scalar operators. Let them call me O1, which has some conformal dimension delta 1 at position y1. Another operator with conformal dimension delta 2 at position y2. And another scalar operator at position y3 with conformal dimension delta 3. The free point correlator is fixed up to an overall overall constant that I'll call C123, which is a really an OPI coefficient, and it is determined as the difference between positions one and two. To the power of delta one plus delta two minus delta three, the difference between positions two and three to the power of delta two plus delta 3 minus delta 1. And we have the difference between positions 1 and 3 to the power of 1, delta 1 plus delta 2, uh, delta 3, sorry, oops, minus delta 2. And so you see the pattern here is the same as for the three point amplitude just with hi playing the role of the conformal dimension. So helicity and conformal dimension play the same way. That's kind of a nice analog, and it's in fact not just a, a clean analog, it's actually a, a really nice clean correspondence. All right, so now let's do some examples. Let's take our formula up here for the free particle amplitude and work out some examples from what we get, since the amplitudes are uniquely fixed this way. So here's our free particle amplitude. Let's clean it up. And let's list also what the results was for the weights x. Okay. So that's what we got. And let's now do examples with this. Let's Take an example where we have all scalars. So h1 equals h2 equals h3 equals 0. And all scalar amplitude, we see that all the powers x have to be 0. And not surprising, this states that the only possible free particle scalar amplitude that you can have is a constant. And indeed, that was exactly what we argued when we studied scalar theories, that a free particle amplitude can only be a constant because the only other thing it could depend on would be Mandelstam's, but all the Mandelstam's vanish in free particle kinematics. All right, easy peasy. Example number two. Let's consider fermions. So let's particle one and particle two be positive helicity fermions and particle three be a scalar. You can go ahead and plug this into our formula here, and you will see that there's only one coefficient that is non-vanishing, and that is the one that gives you that this amplitude is square bracket 1, 2 to the first power. This has mass dimension 1 for the kinematic part, and that in particular implies that g is dimensionless. And that is exactly what we end up having for Yukawa coupling, and indeed, a Yukawa coupling was precisely the thing that had this amplitude, as we saw previously in our examples in part one of lecture two. All right, example number three. Let's now deal with vectors. So here, let's write particles one and particle two as vectors with positive velocity. And I'll choose particle 3 to have negative velocity, 1. Go ahead, plug these numbers in, compute x1, x2, x3, and you'll find that there's a clean answer. It says that g is g times 1, 2 cubed divided by square bracket 2, 3 times square bracket 3, 1. This combines to have mass dimension 1 which tells us that g has mass dimension zero, it's dimensionless. And of course, this is exactly what you would expect it to be for 
Yang Mills Fury. And G is then the Yang Mills coupling. Now, if we go back to our previous example here with the fermions, we see that onto interchanges of identical fermions, we should get a minus because they're fermions. And we see that this minus would arise exactly from interchanging particles one and two here. On the other hand, in our gluon yang mills amplitude that we just wrote down, we see that something else uh, is a little bit problematic. I have two identical bosons. Interchanging them should give uh, a plus sign. But when I go here on the other side and I interchange one and two, I get a minus. That looks very problematic. What are we missing? Well, we're missing that there is another structure associated with gluons, namely that they carry a color index. So gluons must therefore have another label. They must have a label that is associated with the fact that there's a non-abelian group. And in order for this to work, and it has to work for all helicity assignments, this must be a fully anti-symmetric structure that enters in the free particle labels 1, 2, and 3. And so what it must be is that the amplitude that we wrote down is not quite right, Without including such a color label, we much, when I write it out here again, then we must include an F1, an, an antisymmetric structure constant, something that is an antisymmetric symbol, and then I'll give likewise my particles this type of label. So now this one is both symmetric, this part will give me a minus sign when I exchange 1 and 2, but this will also give me a minus sign when I exchange 1 and 2, and together that combines to give the correct both statistics. So what is the thing that sits out here in front? This thing is really what we call the color-ordered color amplitude, or partial amplitude, and A3, 1, plus 2 plus 3 minus equals g square bracket 1 2 cubed divided by 2 3 times 3 1 is in fact what we'll call a color ordered amplitude or color stripped amplitude meaning that i have stripped off the color trace or the color factors f a b c's and here i use the square brackets to denote the color ordering So we have learned from this very basic analysis, a very important point, that interacting spin one particles require a non-abelian structure. So in particular, spin one, three point interactions require a non-abelian color structure. And that's a nice lesson to get basically from for free by having gone through the obstacles in the fairy tale and gotten to fight the dragon. And this is part of the half kingdom that we are rewarded. Let's do another example. I happened here to pick spin one particles with helicities one plus plus and uh, minus. But what if I pick them all to be the same helicity? Now let's pick particle 1 to be positive helicity, particle 2 and particle 3 also to be positive helicities. And I will tentatively just put a bracket around this and then write G. And working out the x1, x2 and x3, you'll find that everything here enters at the same level with x1, x2, x3 equal 1. And it gives me something now that has mass dimension 3. Then in order for the overall amplitude to have mass dimension 1, it must be that the mass dimension of the coupling is minus 2. 
I can also look and see that this whole object should be both symmetric in all interchanges of labels 1, 2, and 3. But if I look at the right-hand side, again, the issue of minus signs arises. So this must indeed likewise come with an anti-symmetric structure constant. And that means that the object that I really wrote down here should be the color ordered one, so I should have a square bracket. This makes sense, because this is exactly the result that arises from a Lagrangian term that has a coupling G times the trace of F cubed. And you may know that if you attempted to do this with an abelian, um, abelian F mu nu, then it is identically zero for the abelian case. And again, we got for free out of a little amplitude analysis that there must be some non-abelian structure in order to have a cubic interaction with uh, spin one massless particles of the same helicity. By the way, you could also look in 4D to check that the coupling dimension G of F cubed is indeed minus two. Very well. Let's move on and look. take a look at, at gravitons in our fifth example, which is also part of half the kingdom. So now let's take gravitons, two with positive helicity and one with negative helicity. I compute my x1, x2, and x3 from the formulas above, and I get some coupling times square bracket 1, 2 to the 6 divided by 2, 3 squared times 1, 3 square bracket squared. Now, indeed, this is both symmetric, just as it should be, under exchanges of particles 1 and 2. If I exchange them, I have positive powers of everything. I cannot get any signs. So for this case, both symmetry is OK right from the get-go. I can look at the expression here, and I see that I have a kinematic dependence that has mass dimension um, of 2. And so that requires my kappa to her negative mass dimension 1, and that's indeed the coupling that you get in general relativity, as it should be. Another little fun feature here, and, and by the way, maybe I should uh, 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 notice where this kappa arises from. In GR, I have the Einstein-Hilbert action with square root minus g times the Ricci scalar. And when I expand this, where the metric is expanded around flat space in terms of a kappa times the fluctuation, uh, h mu nu, then I get an action with some kinetic term that looks like h, d squared h schematically, plus kappa d squared h cubed, plus kappa squared d squared h to the 4, plus, in fact, infinitely many terms with n fields. And, of course, this is very schematic. Schematic, the indices are contracted in all sorts of ways and give rise to very complicated uh, Feynman rules. Now, if, if, and so this kappa here is related, of course, to Newton's constant, and that's how you, you get it to drop out from, from the overall kinetic term. All right, so one of the fun things that we notice here is that M3 is the expression that we get for M3 here, let me not write the uh, expressions explicitly, is in fact, indeed, up to the overall constants, the amplitude of our... Actually, I will write it out just to make clear what it is that I'm saying. If I take my gravitational amplitude here for free gravitons, I will notice that up to overall factors, this is exactly the same as the May Young Mills amplitudes squared that we found above, the color ordered Young Mills amplitude squared. And this is a pre sign, so to speak, of what we'll learn about in lecture four namely the double copy. The gravity three amplitudes are yang mills amplitude squared in a certain sense. All right, so here's an interesting thing. Three amplitudes are uniquely fixed. 
we've given some examples of this, so three point amplitudes of massless particles are uniquely fixed up to overall constants. But then we also learned in lecture one that n particle amplitudes factorize into lower point amplitudes. And, uh, uh, and they factorize on, on the simple poles. And of course, they're only allowed at three level to have simple poles. So you might look at these two facts and ask, question mark, if it is possible that this implies that, n, that three point amplitudes determine all n point three amplitudes. In a given theory. This turns out to be true in many cases. In fact, this is true for Yang Mills theory and Super Yang Mills theory, and it's true in gravity. Now, one way to see this is, for example, through these BCFW uh, recursion relations that I mentioned briefly in lecture one, and that you can learn more about in, in the literature if you're interested. So I want to end this lecture by making some comments about whether we should be surprised about this. Is this surprising? Well, let's consider Yang Mills theory. The Yang Mills Lagrangian takes the form of trace f squared. And recall that f mu nu in the non abelian theory is the usual field strength uh, plus a term which is the commutator of these matrix valued fields. That means that when we expand out the Yang, -Mil, the Yang Mills Lagrangian, if we write it out, you get one term, which is the kinetic term. This is what gives you the propagator. We get a cubic interaction, which is responsible for the free particle amplitude. And then from the, pro from the commutator squared, you also end up with a four point vertex. These three point amplitudes will give you helicity uh, constructions of plus plus minus and minus minus plus. We saw that same helicity setups will necessarily correspond to f cubed type of operators. So if it's true, as I stated it was, that the free particle amplitude determine all n particle amplitude, why is a to the four there? Why is that needed? Well, it's needed, as you know well, to ensure gauge invariance in the off-shell Lagrangian. Now, why do I mean off-shell? Because to get to see that this is a gauge invariant Lagrangian, I don't need to use the equations of motion of the field. And so it's an off-shell gauge invariance. It's a way of writing the Lagrangian in a manifest local and gauge invariant way at the cost of redundancy of variables. But this four-point interaction is not needed on shell. And we can infer that this is the case because the free particle interactions determine everything. At least they do so at three level. And sort of that's an interesting point that if you were to try to construct the theory with just a cubic interaction at the level of amplitudes, you will, by water densities that you may be familiar from Peskin and Schroeder, find out 
that one should take a leg off shell and then try to ensure gauge invariance through the through the standard gauge in, gauge uh, theory ward identities that you will be required to have that quartic coupling. But from a purely on shell point of view, a to the four is completely unnecessary and not needed. So what do the n particle Yang Mills amplitudes look like? Well, there's a very famous formula called the Park Taylor formula. That gives the so-called maximum helicity violating amplitude. It's called MHV, a sort of silly historical name. Maximally helicity violating amplitude. And all what that means is is that there are exactly two negative, and this again in all particles being outgoing, all two negative helicity gluons, and n minus two positive helicity gluons. And so as a color ordered amplitude, what this looks like is the following. And that is what the Park Taylor formula is. It says that if particles one, two, etc. a positive helicity up to particle i, which I take to be negative helicity. And then all particles else are going to be, all particles are positive except particles i and j, who have negative helicity. And this is color ordered, so the color trace is removed. We'll talk more about how this works in lecture 4. This is then with i and j as the distinguished negative helicity external particles. This gives me angle ij to the fourth, and then a cyclic product of all the other angle brackets in for the all, all glue ones available, including the negative velocity one. And this is then a cyclic product, as you can see in the denominator. This has to do with the fact that this is multiplied by a single trace of generators. All right, now, one thing you could check easily here is that the little group scaling is indeed working out if you wanted to. And what is remarkable about this formula is if you were to calculate this amplitude at, say, seven points with Feynman diagrams, you will need 154 diagrams. So at seven point, you need 154 Feynman diagrams to calculate this. But in contrast, the Park Taylor amplitude, in contrast, the formula above can be derived recursively using, you could, for example, use induction. You can use the recursive techniques like BCFW to derive it in maybe one page or two, depending on whether your handwriting is as big as mine. So this is rather remarkable. It never uses a to the four. It only uses free particle information. Four particle amplitudes factorize into two free particle amplitudes. Five particle factorizes into four point and three point, and so on recursively. You can build everything up and very simply prove this formula inductively. Now that's Yang Mills. There's a parallel story in general relativity. And as I said before, general relativity uh, is a you can you can calculate amplitudes perturbatively in GR. Where did it go? Here. And it involves expanding your metric around flat space. And that one that then generates infinitely many interaction terms. And of course this this is pretty 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 bad. So what comes out of this expansion is that the free particle interactions determine the free particle amplitudes. 
And those amplitudes will have helicities plus plus minus or minus minus plus in parallel to the Young Mills case, but now for gravitons. Now these three particle interactions through BCFW were other recursive techniques fix all endpoint amplitudes at three level. And that means, again, that all this other junk that sits in the expansion of the action is only really needed to ensure the off-shell diffeomorphism invariance of the action. If I were to calculate a four-particle amplitude using the Feynman rules in a standard Dedonda type gauge, my propagator has four terms. My cubic interaction is about half a page or so, and the single S-channel diagram is about a page of LaTeX. Then you have those four diagrams, including that of the four-point interaction, to add up. So four pages, say, of LaTeX, and it all simplifies to something extremely simple, as it turns out. Now, the tree level somehow encodes the classical physics. And given that all the tree level amplitudes can be fixed using just the cubic interaction, you might suspect that there's a way of also solving equations of motion perturbatively around flat space using just that as your input. And so a standard thing to say is that this information should then, this simple free particle amplitudes that's fixed by just simple spinner helicity and dimensional analysis is enough in principle to get the Schwarzschild solution. Of course, there's a lot more that you'd have to do to actually get there, but in principle, there are statements such as this. Now, what happens beyond four points? We talked this entire lecture about the rewards. We fought the dragon, we won. We got some rewards that free particle amplitudes in certain cases determine all n particle scattering at three level. But what about things at four point? At three points, Everything was very simple, but what about at endpoint? For example, if I have a local operator, such as, for example, a f to an f to the four with an abelian field strength f. So this would be, of course, a four-point operator. So in general, an endpoint am amplitude that comes out as a matrix element. of an n-field local operator. Such a thing must be a local polynomial in angles and square brackets. And this is in parallel to our scalar story where things had to be polynomial, matrix elements of scalar operators had to be polynomial. And scalar operators, I mean, operators construct of scalar fields only must be polynomials in the Mandelstams. But here, they, including fields uh, associated with spin, we must have polynomials in the angles and square brackets of some degree that is determined by the dimension of the operator. The variables are subject to momentum conservation, which says in spinner helicity language, that the sum from 1 to k, sum from 1 to n, for an n-particle amplitude associated with an n-field local operator, must add up to zero. This, of course, here simply being pk. And then they're also subject to what is known as the Schouten identity, which is a fancy name for the very simple property that Given that I have two component spinners, as some of them, uh, if I take any kind of free, if I take any three two component spinners, they must be linearly dependent. And that can amount to a statement of the following form namely, that this sum of cyclically rearranged labels i, j, and k must vanish, and similarly, for, for the square brackets.
Okay, and these are known as the scouting identities. So let me just give you one example, and that has to do with nonlinear electrodynamics. So nonlinear electrodynamics is some theory with an abelian F. And I Lagrangian, which schematically would be a form of some F squared plus some constant times something with F to the four, that could be a D squared F to the four, the equivalent F to the six, etc. Such terms could arise. Now, I don't care what the Lagrangian looks like. This is just to get you the idea in mind, but I want to find out what the amplitudes can possibly be. So suppose I look at photons here with two with positive velocity, two with negative velocity. What could possibly arise from an operator of the form f to the four? Well, it must be local polynomial term in angles and square brackets. And I could do a similar analysis to what we did with the little group scaling and dimension analysis for uh, for the case of um, for the case of the free particle interactions, and I would arise at the conclusion, arrive at the conclusion that there's only one thing that this can possibly be, namely square bracket one two squared times angle bracket three four squared. This has the right little group scaling, and as you see, this has dimension four, and so I have to compensate to get something that is overall dimensionless for, as is correct for a four particle amplitude with one over lambda to the four. What about other helicity arrangements? Well, I could have all plus, and then I can write down the most, the simplest thing that is compatible with both symmetry, and that is square one, two, square three, four squared, plus the permutations of this to ensure both symmetry. And so, and that's the only thing it can possibly be. Finally, what about having three positive and one negative? Well, there's no possible way with the right little group scaling and everything else that I could write down something at this order that has the right little group scaling and is Lorentz invariant. There's no way to contract the indices, so this must be zero. So what does this say? It says that there are two independent matrix elements that are correspond to f to the four. But going back to the Lagrangian, that is not so surprising because what can f to the four really mean? f to the four is clearly schematic. It can mean f mu nu contracted with f mu nu, all of it squared. Or it could mean f mu nu, f nu lambda, f lambda kappa, f kappa mu. So basically something that is a cyclic um, contraction of the indices. Now it turns out that a particular linear combination of these two independent operators correspond precisely to the matrix element which is of the MHV form, namely the plus plus minus. This is precisely associated with the linear combination of these two which is f mu nu, f mu nu squared minus 4 times f mu nu, f nu lambda, f lambda kappa, f kappa mu. And a fun, and of course there's some other linear combination that gives the all plus. So what I'm trying to, to explain here is that when I find two independent matrix elements, that means that there are two independent operators, but the basis there's a basis change when you go between operators and helicity matrix elements. As a fun little fact, there's the born infeld action, which is the action on a space-filling brain, a space-filling D3 brain, and it takes the form of minus determinant of eta mu nu plus 2 pi alpha prime f mu nu. And if you expand this out in small alpha prime, you find your usual, and here I'm, I'm going to be a little sloppy with the factors, but there's basically your usual kinetic terms plus a certain number times an f to the 4, which is exactly this combination that sits here. 
And the fact that this only produces the plus plus minus minus matrix element is no coincidence because in four dimensions, von Infeld has a duality symmetry, which is electromagnetic duality. And how it manifests itself on the tree amplitude is exactly as a statement that amplitudes vanish unless they have the same number of positive and helicity, negative helicity states. So this is zero unless n plus equals n minus, and that is the on-shell amplitude way of saying that born Infeld theory has electromagnetic duality. Okay, now I will end this lecture here and simply just mention that the spinner helicity formalism is widely used. There are many applications of spinner helicity. Not just for the purpose of using as input at three point where everything is fixed and then you can go to higher point, but also very importantly to fix higher the matrix element of high derivative operators. When is that useful? It's useful if you want to understand the UV structure of supergravity theories. And it's useful if you want to label and find a basis for standard model uh, effective field theory operators. So standard model effective field theory, higher derivative operators, in, in which case you would use a massive spinner helicity formalism. And exactly this is what people are doing and has been done in many contexts and is still under investigation in many, in many ways. So I will end this lecture here and hope to discuss uh, these ideas with you more in the discussion section.